Welcome to Naperville Church of Christ. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. As you saw in the opening, Arrow Bible Camp is coming up very soon. There's a lot of work being done by many people in our congregation to give you an awesome virtual camp experience. The last day to register and receive a supply box, which includes one of these awesome shirts, is July 8th. The cost is only $10 per child, so register today. We have some great news. We will have our first live worship back at the building next Sunday, July 5th. We are only able to accommodate 100 people currently, and you will need to pre-register for this live gathering. A link to register you and your family will be going out today, so keep an eye on your email and our website, naprovillechurch.org, for detailed information on this live gathering. For those not attending at the building, you will still be able to watch online right here at 10 a.m. next Sunday. We are so happy that we are one step closer to all being back together.
Hey church. Yeah, I'm I'm in my car, so uh, let's do this. Let's 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 go to the Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, um, we are just so thankful to be able to come together in this moment, uh, to come together as a body of believers that are bound by your love and your grace and your mercy. And uh, Father, we are uh, eternally humbled uh, by uh, the love that you have shown to us and the way that you have reached out to us. And I think particularly in moments like this, we continue to be reminded uh, of just um, how big you are and that uh, regardless of distance between us from home to home or across states and countries, uh, that you are everywhere. And so, uh, Father, it just reminds us of our purpose, which is just to uh, give you glory. Uh, Father, that's uh, as your creation, uh, that's what we want to do. And so in this, uh, in this time today, uh, whether it be through the songs that we sing or the words that we exchange, we just want to make sure that you are glorified. Um, so, Father, uh, help us to uh, find ourselves in this moment with a sense of peace, uh, that we can set aside whatever uh, distractions or whatever troubles or challenges we may find ourselves in, uh, and we can see you in this moment, and we can feel the connection uh, to our brothers and sisters, uh, and we can glorify you. Father, uh, above all, we want to thank you for your son. Thank you for the gift that he is, uh, for his life and for his resurrection and for the power of his salvation. Uh, we celebrate that this morning as we uh, go into this time of worship and study. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing, amen, amen, rejoice, amen, amen, glory be to God, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, rejoice, amen, amen, glory be to God, amen, amen, when the Lord shall come again, let the people sing, amen, amen, when the Lord shall come again, let the people sing, amen, amen. Amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, let the people sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, let the people sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, rejoice, amen, amen, glory be to God, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, rejoice, amen, amen, glory be to God, amen. When the Lord shall come again, let the people sing, amen, amen. When the Lord shall come again, let the people sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen. Let the people sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen. Let the people sing, amen, amen. Good morning. I want you all to know that Ro and I miss being with all of you. In a few minutes, we're going to be giving prayers for the communion. But before that, I wanted to talk about the power of prayer. I have a very active prayer life, and I've had that since I was a, a young boy. During this time right now, the COVID has disturbed our lives in ways we never thought could happen. Uh, we've lost jobs, uh, we've had friends that have been sick, and we've had friends that have died. And it's, like I said, very, very disturbing. And I've connected with friends during this period, and they've all asked, how are you doing and how are you coping? And my response has been, we're fine. And the way I cope is through prayer. And if you're young, this is the strangest time of your life. If you're older like me and maybe older than me, you may remember something called polio. Polio was something that hit children mostly. And it usually happened in the summer. 
And the ramifications of polio was that you either were paralyzed and had to be put into an iron lung, or you were crippled and had to be on crutches or a wheelchair the rest of your life, or you died. And it was a very, very scary time for everyone. And the common thing about polio and COVID right now was the fact you never knew where it came from, you never know how you caught it, and uh, there was no cure. And so it was very, very scary for parents and, and children too, if you were old enough to know what, what happened. And in 1952 was a horrible year for polio because there were so many people who got it and so many people who were paralyzed and crippled and died. And then, and then in Chicago was not much different because in a sense, they did what they could back then. They closed our pools, they closed the playgrounds, they, you couldn't go to movies. And so the reaction was somewhat similar to what's going on right now. And in 1953, it started off the same way, uh, high rates of people getting it and the same reactions of closing everything. But in the late August of 1953, just before my sixth birthday, uh, I woke up with a headache, a terrible headache, and I couldn't move. Of course, my parents called the doctor and he came over. And back then, uh, doctors made house calls. And he told me to, told my parents to get me to the hospital. And we went to Mount Sinai Hospital on the west side of Chicago. And they performed a spinal tap and they told my parents that I had polio. And the sad thing about that, there are many sad things about it, but one of the sad things is the doctor told my parents there's not much we can do and we're gonna do all we can to save his life. Well, I was put into isolation room and uh, the only way I could uh, speak to my parents was through an intercom. But my parents called uh, our preacher at the downtown Chicago Church of Christ. His name is Walker Petty. And he called everybody from the congregation. So the next evening, there were people from the congregation coming in and they stood outside my room. They had a big window and they prayed. And they did that every night. Sometimes there'd be four people, sometimes there'd be 20. And they prayed and they prayed that I would get better. But despite the prayers, and like today, some of us are praying for things that just aren't happening. But despite the prayers of my friends from church, I got worse. I, my eyes were crossed, uh, I couldn't see, I was almost blind, and my jaws were paralyzed. I couldn't talk or eat, but they continued to pray. And after a few days, the doctor told my parents that uh, I was getting worse and I was probably going to die. And he said that he's been working with a doctor from Pittsburgh named Jonas Salk. And they are working on a vaccine. And the primary purpose of the vaccine was to give it to healthy children so they wouldn't get polio. But it was very early in the stages of this experiment. And they really, and it had not been approved by the FDA. And so, but my doctor told my parents that uh, Dr. Jonas Salk suggested that they give it to me. And he, he was emphasized that we have no idea what will ever happen to him. And so my parents agreed to do it. And they gave me the vaccine and the people came from church and they prayed and they prayed about how the vaccine, way they prayed that the vaccine would help me. And uh, for days, I didn't get any better. But shortly after my sixth birthday, uh, I woke up, I could see, and my jaws weren't paralyzed. And I thought the nurse was gonna faint uh, when she saw that. And she called the doctor 
And all, through all of this, one of the things that I want to emphasize was the thing that I remembered. The doctor came in and he said, son, it looks like the vaccine and the prayers of your friends have worked. And within less than a week, I was home. That was 1953. In 1954, the FDA approved the SOG vaccine. And in 1955, they started giving it to healthy children. And between the SOG vaccine and the Sabin vaccine, by the 60s, polio was gone. And so through all of that, I, I'm a very big believer in inoculations, but also the thing that stuck through it stuck to me was the power of all of those prayers. And during this time, I recommend, of course, we're all praying for the people who are uh, the doctors and the nurses and the people working at the hospitals and all the wonderful things they're doing. And we're praying for the people who have the virus and we're praying for people who have lost friends and family to the virus. But my friends, when we were talking during this period, they would say, how do you cope? And I'm suggesting that one of the ways all of us can cope is through prayer. Because I know it works. And it's such a relief that when you're sad, you pray. And when you're scared, you pray. Because you know that the one that's listening can actually do something about it. So now we're gonna go pray for the communion. But before you do, I would like for all of you to think about those prayers that you're saying and think about the power of their prayer because of the one that's listening. A while back, I earned a title of Certified Kingdom Advisor. When I earned that certification, I received a copy of Randy Alcorn's book, Money, Possessions, and Ethics, which is a lot thicker than his book, The Treasure Principle, I had read some time ago. Frankly, I'd put off reading it for some time, but with COVID-19 eliminating a lot of activities, I picked up some reading that I put off earlier, and this is one of the books I'm reading now. As the title suggests, the author is encouraging us all to examine our perspective towards money and possessions 
in an eternal context. Recognizing that God owns everything and really thinking about the author's assertion that we are only stewards of all God entrusts to us for our time on earth, a couple of bigger takeaways I've derived is the notion that whatever giving I do today is effectively an investment in my eternal future, and the realization that getting caught up in what I earn or what I have here is pretty pointless since none of it lasts and I can't take it with us. Driving that point even further home for me was my recent stint as the executor of my parents' estate. My mom passed away just over a year ago now, and it's taken just about all that time to get her stuff distributed, sold, or given away. I initially thought mom had possessions we all cherished and had great memories about, but when it came to actually taking her stuff, there were many things that none of her five kids or 15 grandkids really wanted after all. With those thoughts in mind, the author's point that we should be regularly asking God for his input on how he wants us to handle his money and his possessions was a good one in my mind. I know 2 Corinthians 9, 7 reads that we should give cheerfully what we've purposed in our hearts to give, which sounds like it's up to us to decide about giving something that's ours in the first place. But my recent reading has prompted me to wonder if it might be more appropriate for us to flip the question of how much we are willing to give to God and ask instead, just how much of God's resources should I be taking for myself and my family's use with everything else going to God's purposes by default? I encourage us all to think about that, both now as you're giving, which can be done via the link on your screen, and in the coming weeks. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all that you've entrusted to us and for the opportunity we have to serve as stewards in your kingdom of those resources. And I pray that you'd bless the gifts that we give and those who are making decisions about how to administer those and that much will be accomplished with all the resources that we put together. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi, welcome. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure, pleasure to have an opportunity again to be with you uh, and to study the Word of God. 
Now, if you're new or fairly new to joining us uh, virtually in our worship service, we want to welcome you as well. Um, uh, hopefully, through the songs uh, that were played, as well as the uh, words that were given through communion, you start to get some insight into truly the family that we hear uh, that we have here at Naperville Church of Christ. Uh, we look forward to meeting you in person um, and hoping that that day will come soon for us. Now, you know, we're now at that moment, if you will, where we dive into the Word of God. Now, before we go too far into scripture, I would really uh, love to take a moment and just pray and petition heaven for God's presence during this time. If you would, please bow your head and close your eyes. Hallelujah and glory to your wonderful name, O oh God. Father, we settle ourselves in this place and in this moment, Lord. We are looking to your word, O oh God, to shed light for us. We're looking to your word, O oh God, today to give us peace in our spirits and in our minds, Lord. Father, we are also looking for change, Lord, not just mentally, but spiritually as well. Father, we pray, oh God, that as we go through the various verses here, Lord, that you will open our ears and our hearts to receive the word on today, oh God. Let us be transformed, oh God. Let us hear something new, oh God, that will give us energy and drive to continue forward in our faith walk with you, we pray. Touch, oh God, those that are listening right now. Bless them wherever they may be, oh God. We thank you for your love, your patience, and your guidance. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So for what it's worth, I mean, you know, a bit of an odd or an awkward title, if you will, and I'm not completely sure if it's grammatically correct for a title, but to some degree, that's neither here nor there. Um, the plan really is for us to get into a certain mindset when we think about for what it's worth. Now, just a few weeks ago, I uh, had an opportunity to be before you, and I was asking us to kind of check our branches for fruit. This morning, or today, what I'd like to do is to kind of get us focused on what is it that we value, and what steps do we take to show that value? You know, to what lengths am I willing to go to show its worth in my life? Um, what sacrifices am I willing to make to show its worth? What actions am I willing to take in order to show what it's worth. Now for this morning, we'll focus in on one of, in my view, one of the more direct parables from Christ uh, that he offered to his disciples. If you would, could you turn to Matthew chapter 13 and we'll be in verses 44 through 46. Now while you're getting there, as I often try to do when I'm uh, going through and preparing, is I try to make sure I'm putting myself in the right mental and spiritual state when thinking about this. And for those of you that are familiar with this particular parable, this is where Jesus describes to his disciples what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he used an example, or a couple of examples actually, where he had a, a, a couple of individuals, one who had um, found treasure, and he compared that to the kingdom of heaven, and another who was looking for pearls, and he compared that to the kingdom of heaven. And more importantly, you started to see what their action was once they had discovered or found this, this, um, this uh, treasure or pearl. Now, we'll get to the details of that later. But again, as I was trying to get my mind around, um, you know, how or have I experienced a similar situation and use that as a mechanism to kind of value uh, or evaluate myself against the text on today. And um I had something that come to mind, and it's a little embarrassing, but you know, for what it's worth, I'll share it with you, right? And uh, so, for many of you, you know that I have a little bit of an interest in clothing, right? Um, Sister Giselle, who, if she's listening now, is maybe chuckling a bit and know that that interest is a little bit beyond just a little, uh, as she fortunately or unfortunately for her indicated to me that she was a bit of a tailor and I had some things that needed tailoring, if you will. And so we've been really good friends ever since. Um, but back to, 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 to this, I... Um, I'll spend a fair amount of time just kind of scrolling uh, um, through different uh, websites, just looking at clothing combinations, right? Shirts and ties and tie bars and pocket squares, suits and blazers and all that kind of fun stuff. So fair degree of interest in clothing, if you will. And some uh, years ago, goodness, five, seven years ago, I was still living in Michigan at the time and was traveling to New York. And I reached out to a friend to say, hey, where's some good clothing spots in there? And I got to be within the right price range. And uh, they indicated a particular retailer. And so I went to this particular place, my wife and I, and three hours later, I walked out with a newfound retailer. You know, fast forward the clock a little bit, but not to today's time. I'm still in Michigan and there's no um, brick and mortar store. 
uh, in Michigan. So I did a, lot, a fair amount of online shopping, you know, every now and again. And I would buy a shirt or a tie or a suit or a suit or a suit or a suit, right? Uh, but again, kind of far and few between. So it was rumored that every three years or so, this particular retailer online would do kind of an, uh, an outlet sale or an online sale, right? Now they didn't do sale merchandise as normally, but if you were the lucky one, you would get maybe a uh, email indicator or some type of uh, notification that you are a special customer and now you have outlet access. So I remember back in my consulting days, I was traveling out of town and I was, you know, at the airport and I was kind of going through my old emails, right? Just kind of deleting them on my iPad, just waiting for my group number to get called. And as I'm scrolling through, you know, delete, delete, delete. Okay, I'll take a look at that later. Delete, delete. I get an email from this particular retailer. And normally it's the, hey, here's the latest shirt or um, here's the must have blazer um, for the office. But this particular email message church said, outlet access, code below. I got to tell you, I, I looked around and started, and I'm not over-exaggerating one bit. I, I started getting a little nervous here, so I, I, I hit click. Uh, I enter in the code. I go to the website and open it up, and oh my goodness, the, the shirts, the ties, the pocket squares, the discount. I'm just shoveling things into the shopping cart. I'm doing this internal calculation, if you will, saying, okay, look, I got a subscription to a magazine that I can go ahead and cancel, and I'll make sure I pack my lunch to work for the next couple of months just to make sure this can all happen. At one moment, my group number got called and I basically said, look, I already checked the bag. I got a seat, so I'm fine. So I'm just going, going. I put it in and luckily for me, you know, I made my flight and I made some purchases. And I remember getting home and kind of settling in. And I mentioned to my wife, I said, hey, um, there are going to be some boxes that are going to be coming here in the next five to seven days that um, it's going to seem like a lot. Right. But for what that access was worth. I was willing to make so many adjustments, right? I adjusted my budget. I adjusted my quirkiness, right? If uh, if you if you realize, I'm one of those, um, you know that individual that you see in the uh, airport that's standing in their group line like 25, 30 minutes before the flight? Well, that, that's me. I abandoned that whole concept because that access code was such a prize to me and my corresponding actions indicated how much I valued it. And I gotta admit, between me and you and everybody else out there in virtual land, I would do it again. And if my wife didn't verbally say it, I know she's saying in her mind, yeah, you have a couple times over. Hopefully, my transparency uh, not only gave you ammunition uh, to use against me the next time we're together, but it gave you an opportunity to get to Matthew uh, chapter 13, 44 through 46. So let's read that. And it says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Now, when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had, and he bought that field. Again, Jesus goes on to say, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. Now, when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, for those of you that are familiar, you'll recognize this parable comes from uh, or comes after and just before a number of parables that Christ had used um, to challenge and to reveal. Um, we've got the sower, we've got the wheat and the weed, uh, the mustard seed, the yeast, and the one that just follows this one around on, on the net. Now, as I mentioned a bit earlier, I find this one, uh, this particular parable, relatively clear and straightforward yet probably the one that's not as easy to digest for me. You know, we see in both of these individuals, both the man in the field who found the treasure and the merchant who was actively looking for the treasure, we see something similar in both of these, a behavior, dare I say, and a life choice. When they saw value, they were willing to make whatever move necessary in order to obtain it. They were well aware of the fact that whatever they had 
whatever they possessed, whatever they were clinging on to, whatever they were trying to polish up and make valuable, paled in comparison to the treasure and the pearl that they had found. They knew right then and there that this is it. Whatever I'm clinging on to, whatever I'm trying to hold as valuable in my life, it means nothing because I have found it. Now, Jesus clearly states to his disciples in this particular parable that the kingdom of heaven is that treasure. The kingdom of heaven, church, is that pearl. And what do you do when you see a good opportunity, when you see a good deal? You take it. You take advantage of it. You make moves necessary in order to obtain it. And I have to say, therein lies the tension. Therein lies the pressure point. Do you value the kingdom of heaven? And I'd even go a little bit further as you, as you evaluate and kind of contemplate that question. Church, what, what is the kingdom of heaven? And I would think if we understood what the kingdom of heaven is, our sense of value and worth and how we order and rank things would be dramatically different. The kingdom of heaven in its simplest form is salvation provided by the gospel, provided by the good news that Christ, through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection, has reconciled us to God. The kingdom of heaven, if you will, is that peace that passes all understanding. It's the peace that I find during this pandemic. It's the peace that I find during this heightened racial tension that we're facing. It's the peace that I find when the pressures of work and family and balancing all these things seem to weigh me down. That is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, church, is the why. It's the why are you here? It's the what are you doing? It's what awakens the spirit and allows you to stop acting and operating in the flesh. Simply put, church, the kingdom of heaven, it's eternal life. It is likely for some of us that we don't truly value the kingdom of heaven, right? Now, I see value in certain things, right? I, I see value in my job and the purchase power that it provides. And I ask myself, well, what, it's, what, is it, what is that worth? Well, it's worth me waking up really early in the morning to get a project done. It's worth me staying up very late to get that project done. It's worth me missing life and family events in order to meet deadlines and commit things because I see the worth in the purchase power. I remember, I remember one time really back in Michigan at the church I, I worshiped at then, on a Sunday, I had a board meeting. And I remember my pastor, you know, understood it, no questions at all. He slid things over on his desk and said, you can take the call from here. And church, I was there taking a board call during communion. Because I put that much worth in the job and the job well done to hear that from my line manager and my peers. Now, I see value in sports and the activities that my children participate in, right? There's the direct link to the, the competition and seeing them compete, the excitement and joy I feel, right? To see my daughter Olivia run fluently down and across that soccer field and have that parent say, man, she's fast. To see my son Elijah chop up other little eight, nine, and 10 year old boys on the soccer field as he crosses back and forth and makes that goal and does his little thing like this, to see my oldest daughter run the third leg of a four by 100 relay with such grace and form, I can see the value in that. And so what has it been worth to me? It's been worth practice after practice. It's been the cost of equipment. It's been the tournaments that we have to attend. It's me see, saying to my wife, I got the morning when you take the evening game. I see the sacrifice that I'm willing to make to get that. I see the sacrifice and the joy and the worth of education as it has uh, allowed me the opportunity to have the employment that I have. For what was that worth? <laughs> it was worth studying nights after nights, cramming material in my head, cross-referencing with other uh, material in order to make sure I understood and could perform well in the, the exams. Now, I see value in these things and I show what it's worth to me almost daily by my actions, my efforts, and the decisions that I make. Now the text tells us, if you read it, that this treasure for this individual, it was hidden. Now we commonly set higher value on things, church, that we can see. 
So the kingdom of heaven, which is held out in the gospel and in our faith journey and our walk, it's oftentimes not regarded as it should be because it's hidden. It's hidden, church, in our faith. It's hidden, if you will, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, where it says, Now faith is the substance of things that we hope for, but it's the evidence of things not seen. Now, what we have to guard ourselves against is measuring God's gift of grace, this um, process he set up through his son that allows us to reconcile us with him. We have to make sure that we guard ourselves, that we don't operate in our fleshly way, where if it's tangible, I believe it. If I can put my hands on it, then I'll make sure I'm making effort and putting forth what I need in order to obtain it. What we have to do is make sure that we walk differently. We have to walk according to our faith. We have to walk, if you will, the way 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 7 tells us we have to walk. It says, therefore, we're always confident, although we know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. We're away from that kingdom of heaven. Like, I'm, I'm home in this body, but as the text says here, we're away from the Lord. For we walk differently. We walk by faith and not by sight. Now, Christians really convinced of the importance of salvation, we will give up everything to win Christ and eternal life. Christians who are convinced of this importance, who are convicted and said, yes, we will give up everything to win Christ and eternal life. Now, what do we see in the men in this parable? Both of them were not only convinced, but they were satisfied with this concept that what they had in the presence was nowhere near the important as what they were going to obtain. That the sacrifices that they were making right now, again, paled into, in comparison to what they could have in this particular treasure. Now, an evaluation of our conduct and how we go about our daily lives is explained for us in this simple parable. We are where we are on our faith journey and we do what we do on this faith journey because we're either convinced or we're not fully convinced that it's worth it. Now, let me stop and say that again, church. Think about this parable and what it's saying. The actions that these individuals took we're either convinced or we're not fully convinced that this is worth it. Now, we may go through the motions, right? You know, I'll, I'll get up and kind of stumble my way to church. I'll, um, I'll pray over my food. I'll, I'll be polite and kind and kind of adhere to some of the moral um, ways of the world, word, if you will. But am I convinced? Am I understanding this relationships and the value of the kingdom of heaven enough to where I am making steps and taking the right actions to support what I believe. Because we know that while I may go through all these motions, the question arises: is, well, where's my heart? Is my heart really into this? You know, turn to Matthew 6, 21, and you'll, you'll see it says there that for where your treasure is, there is where your heart going to be as well. So again, the question for us is, where's your heart? Now, is it still in your self-righteousness and your rationalization of your behaviors? Is it still in the actions that are driven by your own selfish motivations and desires? Is it still simply in your old life? Is it attached to those companions of the past? Where is your heart? Or is it in the kingdom of heaven? As oftentimes I find Paul is able to articulate and explain things that I can't always do. I think he describes it so well in Philippians 3, verses 2 through 11. And I, I know it seems like a, a fair number of verses, but, but church, if you bear with me, I think you can really start to feel what Paul felt, what we should be feeling if we are convinced and convicted that the kingdom of heaven is worth this much. And it reads, you know, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, 
We who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. <laughs> Though I myself have reason for such confidence. Watch Paul. He says, look, if someone else thinks they've got reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. <laughs> Circumcised on the eighth day of the gospel of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. Check. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Check. In regard to the law, a Pharisee, check. As for zeal, prosecuting the church, check. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless, fault, faultless. But he goes on to say, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Church, did you, did you read that with me? Paul eloquently describes the value that he placed on knowing Christ. He said all that education, all that pomp and circumstance, all the awards, the medals, the recognition, the promotions, all that stuff, I count that garbage. Because the value of just knowing Christ means so much to me. That is what it's worth. And we know Paul's life, what he sacrificed in order to obtain that relationship and that desire with Christ. Church, I'm just petitioning and asking us today to have that level of enthusiasm, that level of zeal that while I value my family, while I value my job, while I value my pocket square, at the end of the day, it's garbage compared to that relationship that I can develop develop with Christ. So the question for us is, so what is it worth? Or is it worth closing off that friend circle and that relationship that you've had so long that seems to drag you right back into your old way of thinking, your old lifestyle, and your old behaviors? For what it's worth, is it, is it, is it that you can break off an unhealthy, an unmoral, an undeveloped uh, uh, relationship that you have with someone? Is it worth searching the scriptures over and over and over again till you understand it and buying supplemental reading materials, asking another church member, hey, how do you understand this particular matter? Is it worth that level of sacrifice? Is it worth saying no to a promotion on the job? Is it worth turning off that television and not watching that next series and not watching that next um, show in order that you can find time to pray and to petition God? Is it worth removing whatever vice, whatever habit, whatever thing that is in your life that distracts you from the kingdom of heaven? So what is it, what is it worth? Now, I don't believe for one minute that this text is suggesting that it is necessary to sell everything you have in order to enjoy eternal life. Now, what we can take away from this text is that the gospel essentially is not receiving the respect that it so rightfully deserves in our life. And church, unless we have the mindset that we prefer and recognize the importance of that to the sense to where I will move aside any and all blocks that prohibit me from connecting with this gospel and living this gospel out every day. Until we get to that moment to where we are honoring the word of God more than we're honoring this world, that we're, not, we're satisfied with the knowledge of knowing him versus the knowledge of knowing what's on our, our jobs or what's in our homes, until we get to that point that we're willing to embrace the fact that all of this is offset by the glory of God, we're not showing it the respect that it so rightfully deserves. I simply offer you this parable as a place for reflection for us. 
Just take it for what it's worth. May God bless you. Thank you again for joining us today. We continue to pray for you, and we ask that if you have any specific requests that you send them to us at the email addresses on the screen. And make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to find out everything that's going on at Naperville Church of Christ. Have a blessed week.
Amen.